coats are coming. Yeah, baby. The red coats are coming, baby. Head to the dungeon. <laughs> oh, I love the energy, guys. You guys are. I don't have. Oh, uh, dude, when we're together, I I'm, think I don't know I'm, how his wife does it. I don't know how dude. his wife doesn't just tell us to leave. Dude, and then and then Zeb gets on when we're watching TV at night, and man, he just hits the wall. But it's because the guy's always on. He's uh, he's on for like eighteen hours, and we're just talking the whole time. And then all of a sudden, I'm like telling him a story, and it's just like, <sighs> wait, time out, Zeb. I I had a did a collage in college, and the collage had just pictures of Zeb peppered through it of him napping. Like you remember that Zeb? <laughs> He was just napping. We'd, we'd take pictures of Zeb just sleeping. Like, you just, we were, like, hanging out Saturday afternoon next to you. Zeb, oh, Zeb's napping. Oh, yeah, Zeb. Yeah, my kids got one of me the other day. I was like this. Sunday football was on. And I was like this on the couch. And they got it and put it in a group text to the whole family. This is how he felt. <laughs> K-Rub will hit a wall every now and again. Hey. k -Rub's Zeb, did you ever see the one with the Cheeto dust all over me in Utah <laughs> down there with my daughter? I ate the fiery no. Cheetos and your fingers were red as your coat. Your probably your fingers are probably red as your coat, right? Oh, they were the, the, those fiery ones, dude. And yeah. It was all over the side of my sweatpants because I kept like wiping it down. <laughs> my daughter took a picture of me and sent it to the to the family with the with the Cheeto bag on my bare chest, <laughs> no shirt on cheese all over the side of the sweats and me passed out in the hotel room in uh in like farmington utah oh that's <laughs> awesome uh so, so this is the barbarian hour if you didn't know all right it's, yeah it sounds like it could be the barbarian two hour well you know i've been telling this friend of ours this mutual friend of ours for about two or three years how the guy would be a gem of a podcast guy oh uh, hmm Hmm. and somebody else was doing that too i i just I, you know i just don't have more time to invest k rob i just i'm like dude you are a natural on the stick i mean you have so much charisma stories to tell everything questions to ask i mean it just rolls off you like you, you're 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 do you i don't know this is an honest question do you put much time into like if you were a real journalist thinking about questions and stuff like that, you probably do, but it seems to be so automatic. He's a natural, right? It's he, my he, life. People have asked me this. It's my life. Like someone, when I was talking to somebody and they're like, Oh yeah, you won't have much prep time every week for doing this side or the other. I go, that's just my life. I love that. I don't, I don't, I don't need any prep time as a matter of fact. Yeah. And they were like, really? You, you don't need, I'm like, yeah, I don't need any prep time. That's just how I live. Do you yeah. think it's think, think about all of our texts? Think about my text with you, Jared. Right. Think about right. my text with you, Kevin. What do they usually all have to do with? I want you guys to think about both of them. Right. Think about like what our texts are about. It's usually information about wrestling, politics, okay, or, or something. Children. But as Mark Wentz would say, why? Do you think it's because do you think it's because you're the youngest of four brothers? I mean, do you think it comes out naturally because you're always kind of inquiring and trying to figure things out as the youngest? Or why is that? Do you think? I think I'm always just trying to learn and observe. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, I, I, you know, I talk a lot. I get that. And like, we get around, like, it was funny. We went over to Kevin's dad's yeah. and, uh, <laughs> Kevin's dad's like, this guy's a piece of work talking about me. And, uh, in, in a good way. Yeah, yeah. 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 Not like he was like, get this guy out of my house. What are no, you doing? Like, like God, man, Kevin, that guy talks freaking more than you and way louder. <laughs> louder. Yes. So, I told, sat you down, what you and Sarah, I went up to Zeb's a visit and I was like, it was three years ago, two years ago. I sat him out. I was like, Zeb, you have to do a podcast. And he's like, yeah, I know. I know. I know. I and, mean, uh, yeah. And basically, I mean, he, he almost live broadcast. He's like, you know, they got the, they got the real housewives of um, Georgia or whatever. I mean, he's like, he, he, he's like almost the real, uh, the real dad of, of, of freaking Ohio or whatever. I mean, he live streams almost everything. So it's second nature to him, man. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, yeah, he, you guys are right. You guys have both been right. You never were wrong on it. And it's just like, never lost but, words. yeah, it's a lot of time and energy. Like you guys are saying now, my thing is like, I think the biggest thing about it is you can't be afraid to be wrong. I think I remember starting as a teacher, I was always afraid to be wrong. My first two or three years, 
And then I figured out, I'm like, what's the worst thing that happens if you're wrong? You can come back and you can fix your mistakes. Right. I think that if you're wrong on a hot take, you can come back and talk about it. And it, it, like, I think that's a, a beautiful thing about it is you can be wrong and I, and, and we can be wrong or we can have a differing opinion. And if Kevin, you're a liberal left person out in the left, uh, you know, West coast, and I'm a conservative Midwesterner, I can still be your friend and we, we can talk and have a great relationship. And I, I think that that's kind of lost in society today. I think people are really afraid to be wrong and everybody's always got to be right. And, Whereas, and they're, they're very rigid when they are wrong. Look, I told my daughter, I made a mistake, you know, a month ago, six weeks ago, whatever it was, we were, you're wrong in coaching sometimes, you know, like you're like, I, I flat out lost track of, of where we were. Like I put her down in the third period. She was down by two points. Well, it was a preseason tournament, man. They were one minute rounds. I should have never put her down because the girl just dropped on her. You know, I wasn't thinking. I got lost in the mode. I was wrong. I owned it. I should have put her neutral. You know? Mm -hmm. That's some good take. And did that, she lose because of it, Kevin? She lost. Yeah. No. no. Um, I'm sorry. That was, she won Western States. That was, so that was at the girls nationals in Des Moines, Iowa. It was the, it was the following weekend. I put her down on the raid raised stage, everything. It was like a, a, a three to one or a two to nothing match. And all the girl did is drop down on her ankle the whole time and then pick the leg up, walk her out of bounds, walk her out of it. And when she finally got escape with eight seconds left or something, you know, it was too late. That was my bad. Right. Right. So, so, so you get caught up sometimes. Right. Right. But that's what makes us grow. Like Zeb saying, right. So, quick question so how did you two cross paths like well how, how'd that come about well so zeb zeb in his in his world travel adventures basically one of the first years i was out at oregon state um the first year second year i'm not sure um contacted coach zaleski i believe and wanted through to jack gillespie through jack gillespie let's get that straight okay, okay. i did not know that yes so, it was a gillespie hookup Gillespie made the, made the connection. Correct. Actually. Yeah. Good dude. Yeah, and, and, and so you came out, you wanted to cover some camps and stuff and, and maybe get a little bit of scratch to help basically pay for your waterfall hiking and, and stuff like that. It's right. <laughs> and then Guilty. It, just, it went from there. Yeah. That, yeah. And it was crazy. Craziest Kevin was on the mic calling a lot of those camps. They had me out for some of the, what were they called? Red flag. What was the gyms? What were Jim's camps calls? Well, he had the, the, the practices. Some of those practices were red flag practices, but no, Got we it. had, um, I think you were there during, I think you were there during, I think there was an overlay. You were there for the team camp where I was on the PA calling the matches awesome. play by play and walking around, like walking around the mats in the field house and then you were also there for the intensive camp, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And I brought Ian with me the one time. Right. And what was really cool is Kevin, Kevin really fought to get Ian the job at Oregon state. Right. So Ian got the, uh, Ian got the volunteer job. Right. right. So, and that was a big part. And that's why camps are so important. And I've talked to John Smith about that because I uh, talked to him in 2017 at the, uh, the camps in um, Wabash, Indiana. Right. And he was like, you know, camps are important. And, you know, I've always seen like camps, you know, it seemed for a while, like they were a money grab or a fundraiser, but now I look at them and it's really in and, and, and your whole job, Kevin, as a, as a, as a, as a high school coach, as a college coach, now as a youth coach, as a middle school coach, you're, you've coached every level. You were in the, one of the greatest two out of three finals. You, uh, you coached Cejudo Simmons match. You were in that corner. So you've done every level, man. You've done little baby Colton level all the way up to Cejudo Simmons level. And it's just so impressive to see the like plethora of your career and, and the spectrum of it. But like everything's relationships, literally everything's relationships. And, and, you know, you can talk about that, but give Jared just, you know, I know your, your past Kevin as a, as a coach, you know, from North Idaho junior college, to Wyoming, to Minnesota, to Oregon State, you know, like you've just had this crazy journey to Crescent Valley, to Coeur d'Alene High. You've had this just crazy journey. Oregon as a wrestler, Spokane Valley, university school as a high schooler, one-time state champ. 
give Jared like, you know, kind of a, an outline of your career as a wrestler and, and, and what we're dealing with a guy where you started and, and, and kind of just walk us through it, Kevin. Yeah. Well, so basically as a wrestler, you know, um, I, I started in when I went to uh, junior high school, I started as a, you know, seventh grade did football in the fall and, you know, first year I tackle football and then it went right into wrestling season. And it was, you know, whatever, seven week season, eight week season, whatever it is. And it just kind of went from there. Um, you know, in ninth grade, we were still at the time it's changed now, but we were still uh, where I lived in the Spokane Valley. We were still uh, uh, a ninth grade was a junior high school. So you wrestled like your seven matches and then you were done. You weren't, you didn't attend high school. You weren't on the, you know, high school team, not even wow. the J, you know, freshman team. So I think at the end of ninth grade, I had 21 matches. Jeez. And so much different than you would expect nowadays, for sure. Um, you know, there's, I think probably a few kids like that, but it's definitely out of the norm, especially today in 2020. But, um, uh, so I started riding the bus up um, to the high school and the high school coach kind of came to the junior high district meet the jamboree at the end of the year. And he said, Hey, uh, this is kind of on the down low. We're really not supposed to do this, you know, but you're going to be up. You're going to be a Titan next year. And it'd really be nice if you could come up and start practicing with these guys and learning. And, and so I did that. I rode the bus up there almost every day for the next month um, and then would practice with the, with the, with the high school guys. And uh, then almost at the end of the season, one of the guys that was like the, the pillar guy of the program for me, he was, he was a senior. He was a two-time state runner up. He was a little guy. So he was kind of mentoring me, you know, he was like a senior 108 pounder. Like he was the, the guy walked on water to me. Gotcha. One day I practice, he said, Hey, so Roberts, are you going to wrestle freestyle this year? I said, what is it? I, I'd never heard the term freestyle. I said, well, you know, what is it? What is it? I didn't know anything about out of season opportunities, nothing like that. And he said, well, you know, I'll bring a flyer to you. But basically the nuts and bolts of it is you can go this spring and wrestle a bunch of tournaments all over the, the state of Washington. And, and they got two practices a week and this and that the scoring's a little bit different, the rules, but it's wrestling. Don't worry. And, Three weeks later, whatever it was, I was doing that, and I and I w went and got thirty matches or whatever it was that spring, which you nice. know was more than I had in my career at that time, and it just kind of took off from there. Then at that time, it was like this is what I'm doing. All the other sports kind of fizzled out, um, with the exception of cross country, which my dad talked me into doing um, to just be in shape for wrestling. Mm -hmm. But baseball went went aside, football went aside stopped doing those and became a wrestler nice nice so yeah pretty crazy um you wouldn't hear much of that these days about like a guy you know um you know like winning you know winning a state championship or something and you know getting a scholarship a division one scholarship something and you know with like basically like 90 matches when he or 100 matches when he got out of high school or whatever but uh, <laughs> So you had under a hundred matches. I think, I think, I think all come, I think I had 101 matches. That's awesome. That, I think so, I that. so you only had three years to win a state title. What changed from you to your brothers? Cause your brothers, your brothers had four chances, I believe. Cause they're younger than you. Right. Am I wrong? Yeah, yeah no, you're right. So when, so they kind of got involved in wrestling a little bit younger respectively at their age than I did um, because I was in it. And, you know, now we saw this opportunity and they could get in the mat club. They could wrestle in the, in the Spokane freestyle club at the time. And so they started, you know, in elementary school um, got a little bit of a start on it. And by the time my brother Dusty was in middle school, um, my dad and another guy that was a teacher actually at the high school that had a son the same age um, approached the school board about, you know, the notion that they felt that ninth graders should be able to wrestle. Like girls and boys in the junior high school uh, were allowed to go out for soccer. 
and go up to the high school. And, and they said, well, soccer's not, um, you know, it's not a sponsored sport in junior high school and stuff. And then, so anyway, I don't know how long this went on, but a month or two or whatever. And they went to this meetings and stuff. This guy was a teacher, which probably helped. He knew a lot of people on the school board, this and that. And they passed it to where the next year they got to wrestle as ninth graders while still attending the junior high school. So my brother wrestled on the varsity as a, as a, as a freshman and did quite well. And then two years later, my younger brother, Andy, actually won a state title while still attending a different school. He'd ride the activity bus up or for the kids that lived in that neighborhood and get to practice, you know, 30 or 40 minutes late every day for high school when the, when the junior high school got out. And then he would wrestle for the, the varsity team, though, and he actually won the Washington Big School State Championship while going to Horizon Junior High School. Your wow. brother was a middle schooler and won the state title, Andy. Yeah, they had they actually had a sign. It was pretty cool, you know. You think of it like for you think of it as like kids, you know. For for a kid at the time, um, he he went to Horizon Junior High School, sixth, seventh, or uh, six. I'm sorry, seven, eight, seven, nine, seventh, eighth, ninth, and they actually had the sign, the billboard up top at school that said, "Hey, uh, congratulations, you know, Andy Roberts." Uh, class triple a washington state high school wrestling wow. champion so wow. you know that just made it kind of cool that's not something you see all the time yeah and that's so different than i guess what we're used to here in ohio i mean that's something i mean that's crazy you know in ninth grade you know you got you know guys ready to roll and then you know yeah and now it is you know okay. now it is they, they, they changed it a few years later they built a new school and they incorporated it was a four-year high school um, but I think the reason they changed it at the time, because the, all the Spokane city schools were ninth grade and not high schools, the ones mm -hmm. out in the Valley were not. And I think okay. that was one of the focal points of like, Hey, why are these kids at a disadvantage? You know, when they go out there and the, and the precedent set that you have soccer up there. And once they got by, by that, well, that's, that's because we only do that because it's not offered. And, you know, their point contention was like, well, this is kind of a different thing too. I mean, yes, there is wrestling, but it's, you know, six or eight weeks and it's done. It's definitely not the same as going to a, a high school program. And um, lo and behold, they, they made it happen. So. Wow. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, so, yeah. so who, who do you have on your, what's the, what are those pictures on your wall behind you there? What are those? Oh, um, so this one is my son, Drew. Awesome. That's Drew right here. And then um, that one over there was just a couple of the seniors from the Coeur d'Alene high school team last year, made a collage right. for me. Awesome. One of the kids, all at the tournaments and stuff like that. They gave it to me at like the, um, the spring banquet. Awesome. Nice. Nice. And Drew, yeah. is he your oldest? Is that your? Drew's, Drew's my oldest. Yeah. Awesome. He's a senior. Cool. He's a awesome. senior yeah. Cool. Now I was just curious, you know, pictures of like, all right who, who are these people or what, what's going on here so yeah that's i think that's a picture uh somebody took at, at fargo or something like that yeah. and and had that had that made and so yeah that's pretty nice kevin um drew is one of the top seniors in the country you guys just went to those elite eight duels he had some really good wins there uh, he's a 145, 152, probably a 57, 65 eventually in college. He could probably be a 49 if he was a, if he was in college now. Uh, but when you look at Drew, you know, Drew is Drew's a tremendous athlete. You know, Drew can run. Um, Drew's probably right around a, a four minute mile. What? Um, wow. Drew was what, fifth or sixth in the big school division in Oregon as a freshman. In cross country is that sixth or fifth i think he was sixth he was sixth and he ran like a, a 15 D drew can run he can break 15 30 in a 5k if he ran on a road race and dry good conditions he'd break he could break 15 minutes yeah He's I, I absolute say, horse i, I want to say he ran like a 15 48 or something on a course muddy that, nasty course though muddy nasty course awful day he told me that and i was like oh what Jeez. yeah with, with, with hills yeah oh my yeah so he did really well at it and then um but he gave it up after his sophomore year he had a stress fracture his sophomore year and um 
and then he he didn't turn out as a junior or a senior um and he just you know that was that was one of those things in the house like my wife was really like wanting him to do it number one is you know she really believes that you know doing something else and cross training and, and doing something else and not you know and it, it, it was just different competition he was very competitive but different than wrestling and she's a big believer in like cross training and just the mental aspect of it like doing something else you know you're going to have wrestling is going to be in your future for the next several years and he loved to compete I mean when he was a ninth grader I couldn't tell you honestly I thought he might like choose running um but um he really wanted to be a wrestler and he wanted to put on a uh, good weight for wrestling, build his muscles up and stuff like that. And he just felt like 40 miles, 50 miles a week and stuff running was not conducive to, you know, building up mass that was going to help him take his wrestling to the next level. So he, he, he gave it up. Yeah, that's it. Me out. Made me so sad. Made me so sad. I, I put him on the, I put him on the, uh, under the, the, the hot white light this summer. And I was like, Hey, I was out there. We were out in Idaho hanging out, you know, doing some stuff with them. And uh, I put him on, the, I put him on the, the hot white light. And I was like, you're running track as a senior. And I think your wife was pretty pumped up about that because I think Drew, Drew can win the 800. He can, he can be a high placer or win the 800 in, in the state of Idaho. You know, I, 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 I just, he's talking really about fast. It. He, he's he's actually he may run track this spring in like the 800 he's grown and he's you know 160 pounds now so the 3000 probably isn't probably like it once was for him you know with a smaller skinnier body i think he's thinking like maybe 800 if he does it so, so what's the wrestling season go ahead Zim. go ahead no he he was sixth in the cross country and then he won the big school division in oregon that year right you're uh, that the uh, last year that you guys lived in Oregon, right, Kevin? In wrestling, yes. Yeah. Okay. So he was all state in track and then won. He won wrestling as a freshman, right? Correct. Wow. <laughs> it's pretty good. That's really good. Yeah. Jeez, oh, oh, man. Wow. wow. Does he, um, so what's the season look like this year? So you said you said he might be doing track because is, is wrestling on pause. So he's kind of thinking, well, okay, maybe he's track. Or... Uh, you know, I just hustled home. We had our, I mean, knock on wood, you know, we, but we had our fourth day of high school wrestling practice uh, nice. today. Nice. And you got to get 10 practices in. So actually right now we are scheduled for a double duel next Friday night. Cool. Which yeah. would be the first 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 meet of the season um some of the out-of-state stuff and you know the schedule's been um contracted i think a little bit we've got some parameters like at least at the beginning there won't be any fans um at all in the stands mm -hmm. you know and but you know to me um that's a that's a small concession i mean even mm -hmm. and, and 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 obviously maybe it's easier for me to say so since I'm a, a volunteer coach there, right, so, right. but, but even if, if that wasn't the case, um, you know, I think it is good for the kids and I, you know, I, I'm not going to get into all the science and this and that, but, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think if the kids can have activities and that's a small price to pay, if, if, you know, all the people can't be in the stands, I would rather have it that way than, than nothing at all. Correct. hundred percent. I'm a, I'm a dad and a, a coach here back in Ohio too. And I, I get it. We had, I was telling Zeb earlier, we had a first match up is next Wednesday and uh County had a shut down. So we're changing schedules, but um, going back to you, obviously it's not about me uh, talking family uh, wife. You said you, she would rather do multiple sports. Was she an athlete or what's, 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 well, her? she was, um, she was, I believe all state in uh, two sports wow. and, was um i don't think three but she was a three sport athlete but i think she was all state in two i'm not sure if uh, but um yeah so her softball team won state all four years at Coeur d'Alene high Jeez. Um, she was all state i don't know multiple times and then i believe she was the point guard on the basketball team i think they won state twice wow cool 
and then was vo- volleyball too. Nice. Awesome. So, you know, she, she kind of came from that, that you know, yeah. and, and all of us did that age to a certain extent, you know, a little bit more than today where, you know, you, you, you go out for multiple sports, depending what season it is. That's the one you're focused on. And, but, um, you know, she's a PE teacher and stuff. And so she, she, you know, she, she, she teaches all of it and she sees, you know, I, I just think she's, um, thinks it's healthy, you know, for kids mm-hmm. uh, to mix it up a little bit. Well, healthy from a you know physical aspect and then right. also kind of, you know, the, so the social and what it, it's, you know, doing long term yeah. too. Right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we loved going to the cross country meets. I got to say that I, I loved it, man. I, I would usually end up running about a mile of the thing to try to try to watch, you know, it's a crazy sport trying to watch, but I will got to, I have to say, I do not miss standing out in that sideways blown rain in Oregon to watch cross country meets at all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I gotta, uh... I gotta say, it, but it was fun. It, it, it was fun. And, you know, it's, it's an interesting sport because, you know, all the kids, every place matters. I mean, every place matters. Like what you get up there, if you're the best guy or like the number six guy or whatever, you can, you know, you have incentive to run faster, to get your team, you know, the lower, the lower points. And um, it's also different from, and I don't mean it bad, um, but you know how wrestling can be, you know, how mm-hmm. wrestling intensity and right there on the mat and sometimes the arguing on the close calls or whatever. And mm-hmm. unfortunately, sometimes the, the, the coaching you see sometimes with guys that maybe don't do it like, like I would do it. Um, and, and I probably have once or twice in my time, but it's not like that cross country, man, everything. It's so upbeat and like, Hey, good job. All right, man. <laughs> like, every kid you know comes in six minutes after the last and and the people are like yeah you know the person may be 60 pounds overweight or something but so it's a big deal for them to finish and it's just a really positive vibe when you go to those cross country meets yeah that's that's cool i don't know if i ever told you this zeb and since we're talking cross country and family so my dad you know pretty influential and i had three brothers i don't know if we talked about that earlier but uh he had so many concussions from football and, uh, and wrestling. And he was a workhorse. I, I can kind of tell you, he's, he's pretty put together for his age, but uh, he had so many concussions that I, this is the seventies. They said, you can't, you're um, you can't do contact sports. I, yeah. I forget the number, but he was hospitalized back in the seventies for like, I think the last one was almost a week. That's how bad it was. But uh, so his junior, this was a sophomore in high school, his junior year, he went to the public, he went to a Catholic school, but he went to the, public school and just ran with the teens. Like, I'm just going to practice with you guys. That's all I'm going to do. You know, didn't have to do it. And you know, just practice, you know? So then his senior year, you know, you talked about changing rules of the school and things like that. So his senior year, he started the cross country team of where, you know, I coach at now and where he went to high school. So he ran and he was one guy short of qualifying for state, you know, second year cross country. So it's probably, uh, obviously probably Zeb can kind of correlate to a little more, but he was just a workhorse. That's my only cross country school story but uh he was just a workhorse running type guy and uh you know fell short that close but uh you know i, I know he wouldn't probably change it for the world and kind of probably learned a lot but uh but that's what i've seen cross country meets that's the thing you know, like guys finishing yeah great you know your pr right the prs and all that stuff that's PR, kind of, right? PR. Yeah. that's that's the thing right and you know yeah heating against yourself and just getting yeah, better every- a lot of really upbeat people um about it I, I went to a kid's cross country meet a couple weeks ago for, for my, my little guy, my 10 year old. And, um, you know, there's no, there was no football. Um, well, their kids wrestling got stopped in basically March, you know, mm-hmm. like everything. There was no little league baseball this spring. There was no flag football this fall. So outside of wrestling a little bit in, you know, our garage here or up at my new facility, I've taken them a couple times. Um, we're really, you know, looking for something to do and everything's kind of on hold, but there's a, a cross country, a couple cross country track clubs local. And I guess with the social distancing and stuff, you know, that, that was the only thing we could fall, find this fall. So he did it and we went to a race and, uh, yeah, it was, it was like the, the people, the the people into it, man, that, that coach it. And, and they're running all over the course and, and keeping times and keeping and, you know, and I told 
I told my wife and a couple of people, I said, you know, the cool thing about this, the people that are in to running that are, that are into it, I'm a casual, but that are into it, they're as into it as people like me are wrestling. Right. I was just going to say that, right? They're as passionate about it. They know the times, they know the splits, where the kids are supposed to be, where they were the time before. If it's a PR, you know, they're giving them tips through the race, like in their form and all that. And, you know, I'm just kind of watching and saying, hey, good job. Keep going. They are as into it as the most diehard wrestling people are. Oh, 100 percent. I, I totally yeah. agree. I've seen that. It's a lot of correlation with the coaching and the programs, right? You got to have that coach. And if you yeah. have that coach, right? They, they have the energy, they have the passion, they have the charisma to get people excited about doing something extremely hard, right. extremely yeah. difficult, yeah. you know, and they make them excited to do it. Right. So you just mentioned have, new, new facility, right? What's yeah, uh, the Roberts dungeon. Yeah. What's uh, did you put some new drywall and insulation up? I think I see. Or what, what, yeah, what do you have going I on? I bought it in early October. I bought a place on 10 acres um, with like, you know, basically about a 40 by 40 pole barn in nice, and it, nice. it, it was sticks and stuff like that. And we, we've since insulated it. We've put drywall up, we mudded and taped it. Um, you know, it's supposed to be painted. It was going to be painted maybe today. Um, I'm not sure if it happened or not. We're bringing in gravel to, to level off some of the ground. We picked up a couple dumpsters full of stuff that was out there. We rewired it. We got speakers in there now, you know, music. I went and I got a new mat uh, the other day. I've got uh, wall pads coming in eventually. I got, you know, I got it. Um, I can only get a little bit at a time, you know, so I'm kind of upgrading as I can as I go and I have the funds to do so. But yeah, it's going to be kind of a year round place for kids to go and train and offer a lot of camps and um you know training camps everything from training camps to small weekend camps but we're just going to kind of offer a lot of stuff you know from early early kid developmental camps more introductory stuff like that or the ones that are just barely getting in to full-on you know like five-day or week-long camps like some of these other places you see out of, out of the country have where if you really want to get better you know you go spend a week with 40 other hammers that just are trying to get better, mm -hmm. you know, training multiple times a day. So that's kind of the vision behind it. And uh, just kind of getting going. Kevin, when I look at that, you know, like we were out there, I remember my dad and Wyatt and I came out and you, Jeff, uh, and we yeah, stayed we, at Kelly's. Yeah. Kelly yeah, wasn't there. Do you remember Coeur that? High School, Coeur d'Alene High School that summer, right? Yeah, and it was awesome. It was like 2013, 2014. I can't remember remember which year. I think 2014, maybe, right? Was that when Ian came and Mangrove No, was no, no. That was a year or two after okay. because Kelly was around when Ian came. Wyatt and my dad were with me. Remember, my dad had never been out there. Do you remember right. that? Yeah, yes, I And do. you got <laughs> to hear some great Tom Miller story. <laughs> oh. Yeah. There was some good one-liners in there. So, oh, yeah, for sure. But, but what was awesome for me is um, what validated your talent and your ability and your gift and your work ethic and everything you've done, what validated it for me was my dad came to the camp every day. I don't he know did. if you remember. My dad was at the camp every day. He came and he watched you. And my dad was like, you got it. My dad said, like, the one night, he was like, man, you're really good. He's like, you're great at this. He goes, and at that time, you're coaching at Oregon State. Correct. Um, but my dad was just so impressed with you. And I know I've been telling you for years, you know, you can be the Jeff Jordan of the West and just so impressed with what you do and how you work and how you relate to kids. And sometimes you'll go off on these crazy rants, but you reel it back in and bring it back in and then you tie it into the education. And I enjoy that. But my dad was so impressed with you. I don't know. My dad's like, hey, man, you can make a million doing this a year. And, and he's not wrong. And I feel like the dungeon and what you guys are doing out there and in the Pacific Northwest is just, it's a special thing. And did you, did you feel like what made you really get your legs under you to, 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 to buy a facility and just start doing it? Um, well, you know, it's kind of crazy because, um, you know, it was something um, 
that had kind of been in the back of my mind off and on um, for years. So like before I got my break at Minnesota, you know, and, and went there with coach Robinson and, and company back then. And then the Oregon state after that, of course, I was really close um, to doing something like that. Um, or not, I don't, I don't want to say really close. I was very much contemplating something like that. I wanted to obviously be involved with wrestling and, you know, coach as many days as I wanted to coach. And, you know, it's just, you know, you've seen me in the room. It's just what I'm in there. That's, that's really what I love to do. Um, you know, I was making $4,000 a year to, at coaching at North Idaho college and, and, and loving it and, and trying to get as much experience and, and be as good a coach as I could. But I knew that that was not probably going to provide for a family and all that long-term. And so I was looking at some different things and, you know, it takes money. I didn't have the money to, you know, rent a facility or buy a facility or rent or buy a piece of ground and build on it. And then I kind of, you know, got, I got the opportunity and went with Jay to Minnesota and then with Jim at Oregon state and all that. And it, you know, it kind of like I was zeroed in on that and, and was really focused on that and doing that. And then the last couple of years, um, you know, after I got out of college wrestling, um, you know, a little over just three years ago, um, it kind of started creeping in again, like this is something I could do and maybe I want to do. And to be honest, man, sometimes crazy things happen. So like during the pandemic, um, all the schools were shut down. No clubs and wrestling rooms, you know, no, I mean, no tournaments. No, And, and, and we still had, um, you know, kids that wanted to wrestle, kids that needed to wrestle, kids not just, you know, for development and trying to get where they wanted to go in the sport, but really, you know, for their health, for right. like, their mental release, for their exercise, for their socialization. And so we started having little workouts in garages and stuff, really. And sometimes it'd be me and my son and one other kid or something. Sometimes there'd be eight of them in there. And that kind of happened from basically March through the summer. And we had a couple camps. Hopefully I don't, uh, you know, come and get arrested or something like that. But we had a couple makeshift like workouts, like with an outside mat or something like that, where there were kids showing up that wanted to wrestle and we were doing this and it, you know, everybody was getting so much out of it and stuff like that. And it was like, I, I think I could do this, you know, I think I could do this. And so that's kind of how, it, it came to fruition, like try to find a facility and, and try to do this, you know, for the next however many years. So what's the, what's the goal from here? Like you, obviously from March to now, right. A lot has changed, right. Now it's, you know, you're, you're in, right. You're in. So what, what's the goal? I know you said you're going to have some, you know, top level camps and then some, some, so what's the, what's the schedule? What's the kind of time frame? Well, right now I got this big calendar in front of me and I'm, 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 I'm plugging in tournaments that maybe we want some of our kids to go to, you know, that train with us and stuff like that. And, you know, especially cause we have some on the Washington side and then some people still in Oregon that have, you know, we have long-term relationships with that they've come up through the ranks with, you know, my boy and some of the others. So we're looking at some tournaments like that. So we can try to put together and, and, and take them, and then plug it in, you know, my son's high school schedule, which like I said, knock on wood, but it's still, it's still good right now, you know, as of today, December 3rd, and it'll go to, you know, mid February. And then looking beyond that, it's setting up the camps, um, you know, and I don't know where we'll be. I mean, I don't know where we're at right. today. Of tomorrow will be the same as far as what we're permitted to do and stuff like that. But yeah, starting in the spring, you know, we're going to have, um, we're, we'll, we'll set out for the whole summer and we'll have some like, okay, we're going to have this guy come in. This guy's going to be a guest that day. And so I'll start reaching out to some of my, you know, contacts and friends and people I have relationships with in the wrestling world to come out and maybe do a day or two or a couple sessions. And then, um, but yeah, big plans, you know, like a spring and summer full of, you know, training opportunities and, you know, depending what the tournaments are, maybe some of them will be like 
training camps for specific events. Maybe there won't be any tournaments at all. And it'll just be like, hey, come spend a couple weeks with us, you know, like it. So nothing's off the table right now, except for just that, yeah, we're going to have a place to train, um, you know, to get better, to get good kids to come together. Um, I've already spoken to some clubs, some other clubs, guys that I might have coached in the past or coached with or against or, you know, been their coach back in the college that are doing like clubs now about bringing some of their guys out, meeting out here, doing exchanges where we get some of our kids together to really try to sharpen each other and, and, you know, raise levels. Kevin, so. When you look at, um, you know, you're, you're, you know, it's all relationships. We talked about that, you know, like an example is you coached Izzy is Israel Martinez, oh, right? Yeah. right? You right. coached Izzy, you were his junior college coach. Correct. Um, wow. you know, that's a great connection, obviously. And then you recruited guys that were on your team. Um, what was crazy is I watched that real woods thing. That's good. And Real's host family was a guy you guys had at Oregon State. Kagan. Really? Kagan right? Collins. Yeah. Right? I'm not, I'm not making that up, right? Yeah, Kagan. Wow. He's, uh, I actually met up with you guys at the Portland airport when Izzy and him came in for a visit. Do you remember that? Um, I remember them coming in for a visit, but had totally forgotten that you met up with us at the airport. Wow. They were coming from Hawaii. Do you remember? I, I remember. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So that was, so Kagan was one of uh, Izzy's wrestlers at Montini. He was an Illinois state champion as a senior. Um, and so he came to Oregon state and that was one of those where, you know, just talking with Izzy and he kind of reached out and said, coach, coach, I got this kid, you know, and, 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 and Kagan's actually, so he's one of them that's coaching college. Now he's, I, I started thinking about this today, man, I'm getting to the age old enough that some of the guys I coached with are actually coach or coached or coaching college now. And he's down at a school in like Kentucky or Tennessee. One of the, I think one of the Cumberland, Cumberlands or Camelsville? One of them. I think it's one of the Cumberlands, but you might be right. I always get mixed up. I think there's actually two Cumberlands, right? Yeah, I believe so. And I, I apologize for not knowing for sure, but he's like a first year coach there. You know, so it's crazy. Kagan Calkins. Kagan Calkins? Yeah. Yeah. And then you got, you know, guys like Roger Kish that have, like, he's been in more than a few years. I, I was, you know, on staff at uh, Minnesota when he was, you know, a red shirt freshman and a sophomore wow. and, you know, now he's coaching at NDSU. And so I don't know if that's good or bad, like, uh, you know, but it means I'm getting older. Um, we all are. We yeah. All are. <laughs> so yep. yeah. It's sure fun are. to follow but... this guy. Though. It's fun to follow their, you know, their careers. Now they're in the, now they're, you know, in that game that I did for quite a while. And, um, so it's pretty cool to follow them. That's really cool. And um, I need to hear more about this Cejudo Simmons thing. I, I'm totally not what Zeb is. Like Zeb's got this trap and I could like, you know, you could tell a story and I could forget tomorrow, but you know, I guess that's why we're recording it. Well, tell us a little more about that. So Simmons, I recruited um, to, you know, well, it wasn't called a training center back then. Now everything's this and that, you know, RC, this and that. It was, a, you know, but basically to a senior club out at Oregon State. And he was fielding different offers and stuff like that and out of Michigan State and recruited both the brothers at the same time, Nick and Andy. My brother and, and I both wrestled Nick. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so that's why I'm, at, I'm curious. You know, Nick's a great guy. So go ahead. Yeah. So still one of my best friends. Oh, that's um, cool like get texts every day or every other day. From hey, Jared beat Nick. Just, I just got to put it out there. Jared beat Nick Simmons in a match. I'm not, I, he, he beat me I, too. We went one on one. Okay. But you did actually beat him too. So let's just, yeah. let's just be mm -hmm. honest. Okay. Hey man, that's a big win. I don't care. That's a big win. Um, but yeah, great guy. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was actually ended up getting both of them, had them out on a visit and everything, you know, just like they were senior level athletes now or on their way to be. And it mm -hmm. was just pretty much like a recruiting trip that goes with kids or whatever, uh, prospects, but 
they both came to Oregon State. That's and, awesome. Um, Andy was there like lesser time. He had a bunch of injuries and stuff like that. And he, he went back to Michigan, but then he kind of since resurfaced a couple times. But Nick was with us five or six years. And so, you know, I got a chance to coach him and, and work out with him quite a bit. Um, still feeling some of those aches and pains, getting my, my time. But uh, yeah, been splayed a couple times. Um, got strangled you got strangled a bunch of times for sure but uh you know i got a couple licks in but uh yeah actually got to coach him um you know in the like 2010 11 12 i think he was fifth in the world in um uh, 11 and then in 12 um you know got to got was in the corner was in the wow. corner with diner of Obviously, you know, to me, one of the one of the greatest uh, modern era freestyle matches that that I've seen. Hold on. Stop. 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 In person, the greatest match I've ever seen. You've got your Carver Hawkeye. It's was it the semis, Kevin? It was the semis, wasn't it? It, it was the it was the semis. Yeah, it was. It was <laughs> electric. Everybody was on their feet. Um, I've posted that video since like, of Henry throwing his shoes in the crowd. It, Kevin, I'm telling you right now, that what that that moment for me was unmatched in person. The energy and the, the hair standing up on my neck, and it was right up there with Kilgore winning an NCAA title for me. Like I was just so jazzed to be there, and and the, and they were crushing each other. They were just uh. hanging it out there. Oh, it was really good wrestling. I mean, great uh, wrestling. Yeah. And, and I was never really a fan of, you know, the three period wrestling. Um, I thought it kept sometimes the action, not as great as we've seen that match was not typical though of, Hey, I'm going to try to win zero one one and take the period i mean i don't know how many points there were scored in that match cumulative but that was action like from pillar to post of that arena man alive if you're gonna <laughs> use man alive use man alive on that please because oh. man alive that was dude i'm telling you right now k rob that thing was and i rewatched it since and my wife and i call it the Chuck E. cheese syndrome like you thought Chuck E. Cheese was the greatest thing ever. And then you're like, oh, you'll go back to Chuck E. Cheese and it sucks, right? I don't have Chuck E. Cheese syndrome. I've rewatched it and I'm like, it's as great as I remember it sitting next to the mat. It's that great. It, and the it, crowd, Carver Hawkeye. Listen, man alive, I'm telling you, there's not a better place to, to do Olympic trials than, than Carver Hawkeye. Would you agree with that, K-Rob? Yeah, I would agree. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and that's, you know, like Opfer talked about the, you know, Opfer talked about uh, not having the steel trap like you do. There's, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm probably somewhere in the middle of you guys. So I can remember things about that weekend though, you know, like being in the sauna, getting that strangler like down the last pound or whatever. Oh getting, man. He was huge, you know, huge, massive huge. 121 pounder. <laughs> Massive. Jeez, so peeps. Yeah. That was so, 121, wasn't it, Kevin? Yeah, it was 121. Yeah. Oh, oh my, my God. God. Felony. Why would they do that to them? And wow. and I and so I can remember things like that, you know, bits and pieces and the electricity of the crowd. And God, I mean, I think, you know, when you talk about the try, I think his first match was against McDonough, who oh was just, you know, a young a young kid, McDonough. I think he was a senior in college. I think he, you know, or, or a junior. Two-time so NCAA champ. That's yeah, all. Three-time time finalist. That's all. A couple, couple-time NCAA champ. You know, I wrestled him. Right? That's not like a match you can't, like, overlook and be ready for. Mm -hmm. I mean, or you're going to be sitting in the, the consolations. And so, right from the get-go, right from the get-go, it was just, you know, it was great. And the ebb and flow is obviously of emotion, you know coming off, you know, coming off that match and then, you know, not, not getting the spot and stuff like that. And that's wrestling and that's coaching. Um, so 
Yeah. What bums me out about that, Kevin, is is and you know, and I and listen, I'll I'll stand by our system compared to the Russian system, you know, because they put who on the team is gonna do the deal for them. We understand that, and they can supersede and take a guy who's better in world. Con- we we have a pure system, and yeah. I'm very much okay with our pure system. Yeah. I'm sure you weren't in April of 2012, I, I, you know, but at the end of the day, Simmons was the guy who was going to medal. You know, Hayes Winkle went 0 and 1 in London. He's still an American guy that I'm, I'm yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to say bad things about Hayes Winkle, but at the same time, Simmons was just, he was such a bad matchup for everybody in the world, and they all knew it. Like, Alter Sertanov won the weight. Remember him, the Russian? Jamal. Yep. D- Jamal. It's started with a D. Jamal uh, Otar Sertanov won the weight. And I'll tell you what, man alive. <laughs> Simmons was a really bad matchup for Jamal uh, uh, Otar Sertanov. You know what I mean? Like, in the Russian. And, well, he's and, just, and I like that matchup. So I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, he's so hard to wrestle in so many positions. He's unconventional. He's long. Um, he's, you know, stronger than, than one might think looking at him. He's got tremendous leverage and I tell you what, he's a hell of a competitor. He's a hell of a competitor. And no, I think you're right. I mean, we have the system that we, that we do and it's not wrong. And, um, but, uh, you know, he, he really, he had a chance, uh, to do something on that Olympic stage if he would have got there. And, you know, I mean, He's not the first guy. He won't be the last guy that hasn't, you know, represented the U S in, in, in the Olympics that, you know, probably could, could do something, but he'd been fifth the previous year and really close. I mean, really close. So he wasn't far off. Crazy. Man. Hell of a gamer. Too. Hell of a gamer. Just a gamer. Hey, Kevin. You know, and I, Coeur d'Alene, your, your brother-in-law is the head coach of Coeur d'Alene, where Drew is a state champ. Um, Coeur d'Alene High, your wife was all state there. Your two brother-in-laws are two of my favorite human beings on the planet, uh, Jeff and Kelly, two of my, my, my favorite guys. Um, but if you were to cut a promo and you were to talk about how you met your wife, how did you meet her? And if you – we're just go, – we're going promo here. We're going WWE promo. What was it like meeting your wife? She's got these big brothers that could probably kill you if they wanted to. Even if they couldn't physically beat you up, they got a bunch of guns. They're hunters. They're pretty accurate. But what was it like meeting your wife? And and if you were to cut a promo on meeting your wife, what would it sound like? Well, Zeb, I didn't know who her brothers were at at the time but I don't know if it would have changed because when I was in Christensen gymnasium around Halloween, 1998, I saw and later met a blonde brother. She changed my life for a long time. Should I go on? Yeah, it's a promo. We're cutting it. Let's go. Let's no, man. this is a promo. We're cutting it. Let's go. Hey, she was a Coeur d'Alene gal, man. And it's no, it's no, uh, it is no made up story. It's not, you know, it's not like an Al Bundy story that with age or anything, you know, gets better. Went from four touchdowns to nine, you know? Um, no, I really did see her come into this alumni match at North Idaho college. I really did. I saw her come in. The spotlight was on. I saw her come in and I, it was like, I got to meet that girl. And uh, so I went and met her after the match. And uh, I don't know, man. I got lucky one time. That's awesome. I don't meet the brothers. When did you meet the brothers? I mean, I got lucky that she. Come on, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. So, That's so awesome. when did you meet her brothers, by the way? Like, when did you meet Kelly and Jeff? Because Jeff, okay, so Jeff Moffat, your brother in law, he's the head coach at Coeur d'Alene High. They've won a couple state titles. You know, he coaches your son, Drew, now, um, unless it's out of state at the Ironman, and in which you come and stay with us. 
yeah, yeah. Jeff Moffat's a great high school coach, a great guy. I love him. You know, you know where you stand with Jeff Moffat at all, all moments of the, of the conversation. He tells you, he lets you know, there's no, there's no, doesn't mince words. Uh, but you know, when did you finally meet the brothers, Jeff and Kelly? Well, so I, um, uh, I don't know. We went on a couple dates and then, you know, I, I, I found out like, you know, I found out maybe, you know, her brothers and I had been in some of the same tournaments. So when I figured out her name and stuff and we started talking and who knew who and the connections, you know, we, we figured it out and I can't remember how. And she's like, oh, yeah, you're probably one of those. You wrestled 101. I said, well, yeah, when I was a sophomore, it was 101. And she was like, oh, yeah, I remember like going to the matches, my brother's tournaments, you know, and you were probably one of those little guys that my friends and I laughed like, how is that guy in high school? Look how small he is, you know, and. And so then, um, you know, we progressed, we were dating and all that. And, and I went to the parents, um, I went to, I met, went to meet her parents who, you know, by, are by far some of the finest human beings, um, ever on this, on this earth, dad, dad, no longer with us, but, um, uh, Mike and Vicky. Yeah. 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 So, so we had seafood, man. I was meeting them for the first time and her dad cooked up all the seafood while, well, shoot man i'd never eaten like real crab and scallops before you know i'd never so i didn't know what to do how to crack it how to stick that thing in there pull the crab meat out i mean i thought seafood from when i was growing up was like those blue boxes the fish sticks that you put in like in the, <laughs> that you put on the tray and, and your mom cooks them up for 15 minutes i swear to god i i had never eaten anything like this so that was eye-opening and then uh i'll tell you a good story about jeff I'll tell you a good story about Jeff. Like you said, you always know where you stand. So Jeff and I that year, I think he was like an assistant coach at the time at Coeur d'Alene. And I was coaching NIC and we'd become friends. You know, we had a seal coating company together in the summers and uh, we do asphalt sealing, parking lots, driveways, all that. And so I was feeling pretty good about myself. I went down and I got a ring. This is, you know, probably about a year and a half or something after we've been dating and you know, this girl's the one for me. Well, so we're going over, we're going to watch this big match in Spokane. At the time, East Valley High School was one of the top programs in the Northwest. Maybe it won a state title somewhere along that way. And they were taken on University High School, my, my alma mater, in the first dual meet of the year. And so we went over there. We got some Zips hamburgers. We were driving. We got to about the state line, Zeb. We got, and you know, Jeff and Jared won't get this as much. He doesn't know Jeff yet, but uh, we're eating these fries, these big old burgers. And I turn on the dome light and I pull this uh, ring out. Uh, you know, I open the thing up and he, he, he looks over and he goes, what's that? And I said, well, well, it's a ring. And well, I can see that. What, 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 what's that, what's that for? And I said, well, I, you know, I'm, and I'm looking for some backup here. You know, I'm really looking for some backup. And I said, well, I'm going to give it to your sister for what, you know, <laughs> very point blank for what. And I said, well, I think on around Christmas or something, you know, I think I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to propose, you know, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to ask her to marry. And he goes, <laughs> we're going 65 miles an hour down the interstate and he goes why would you do that <laughs> and I, well, I thought it'd be good like and he goes i lived with her for 18 years man I, I i don't know i don't know and that's jeff man uh, i gotta literally meet, uh, your brother-in-law jeff i gotta meet this guy oh uh, hey, kevin goes, kevin why would kevin. you do that <laughs> that's very much so jeff moffat we, we all get that kevin this is a great question that I've been thinking about. It's been rolling, tumbling around in my brain. Okay. Evaluating talent. That was a big thing you did at North Idaho, Wyoming, Minnesota, Oregon state, right? You're a recruiter, right? And, and the JUCO is very different than the D one because JUCO, you can have whoever you want. And there's some, there's some, they got some kinks. They got some things that come along with them, right? Sometimes. D one Minnesota is obviously very different. But, you know, just talking to you two, you know, Jared Opper. Jared Opper, was, he was the pedigree coming out of, out, of, out of high school. Jared was a four-time state champ. 
He'd won everything. And then you were a one-time state champ, barely with 100 matches. And then you got someone like your son, Drew, who's been a multiple-time cadet, Fargo state, uh, Fargo freestyle pl placer, been a Fargo junior placer, and then you know, he placed at the Ironman last year. He's won state titles in uh, Oregon and Idaho. Evaluating talent, what's that like, and how do you gauge it? You know, like you're a one-time state champ, Jared's a four-time state champ. How do you figure out what guy's going to pan out, and how much of a gamble is it? Well, I think, you know, the big thing is, and listen, I didn't make all this stuff up, right? Like I, you know, some of it, you, you develop your own, you know. The, the, Wait, some these of... aren't trade secrets? Hold on. These aren't trade <laughs> secrets? We can't have your brain and own it? Are you sure about that? These well, aren't no. trade secrets? These aren't things that we can own? We can't own your mind? Are you sure about that? No, I'm can just we saying prove that in the court of law? Up. I, ha I had some great people that I learned from is, is what I'm saying. So, you know, you pick, you pick stuff up, you know, if you look at guys that, you know, coaching with guys like Jim Zaleski, Jay Robinson, Joe Russell, Marty Morgan, Troy Steiner, you know, Brandon Agum, um, you, you pick things up and, and, you know, so some things though, that I would really look at is like, where are they? Are they making a jump? You know, are they making a jump? Like, they're, do they make a jump from, like, say, their sophomore year to their junior year, their junior year to their senior year? You know, and are they still going like this? Um, I really think you look at, you know, and you, and you try to gauge. And you're not always right. You miss sometimes, um, you know, on both sides. Sometimes you're like, oh, this guy's he, and, 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 he, and he's not. And then sometimes you under value a guy i don't want to say value but you 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 know you don't rate them as high as you probably should and they go on to prove you wrong in college but you know you i i like to look at what's their passion for the sport like does this guy really want to be great and you know what does he like in practice i like to watch him practice when they're kicking everybody's ass in a tournament you know they look really good um, what are they like in a really tough match? And it doesn't always mean they win. You know, they might lose the match where you're really evaluating them and stuff, but you might come off with a, a, a positive opinion. How are they when chips are down, when a call goes against them, when it's a tough match, when fatigue's in there, when they're not feeling a hundred percent, you know, what are they, what are they like? And, um, you know, and then a little bit too is, how long of how, how um, you know, like their age. I think that's a big thing when you're 19 and you're in high school and you're wrestling 130 or something like that. And I'm not saying everybody again, there's, there's differences, but you know, if somebody 17 and a half or 19, that's a little bit of difference sometimes, you know? And so I would look at all of that. Um, I, I would look at all that, you know, what, like, what's their passion? How do they work out? And I'll tell you what, it's crazy because I went and watched some kids work out and you would think um, that a kid would at least fake it and work really hard that day if eyeballs were, and I've seen some where they didn't. And I left and like, okay, well, he's, he's off. He's off the list. Or um, the things they say, the, the things kids will say if you give them the chance. You know, like, oh, how was practice? Oh, you know, it sucked. We had to wrestle like live for 30 minutes and run sprints at the end. Yeah, probably not what I'm looking for. Right. You know, what I mean? so you just try to read the tea leaves a little bit. You try to like see like what their skill level is, how hard they wrestle. Um, but it all goes in there, right? And sometimes you're really high on a guy. And you miss on him, he doesn't quite work out. And then sometimes, you know, a guy will really surprise you. So, but but you try to put all that in there, I think. And, um, you know, really, you know, try to figure out who the person is, you know, who they are, what kind of person they are going to be like off the mat and that kind of thing, because it's going to carry over into their training. If they have issues off the mat, if they're barely getting by in high school grade wise, even if they 
you know, even if they really turn it up in college, if there's somebody that's always going to have that hanging over their head. And I've had some of those guys, right? And I've had, and, and sometimes you take a gamble and you take some of those guys. But if they have all that hanging over their head, you know, all these outside stressors, these things that, you know, are going to interfere with coming to practice every day, getting ready to wrestle and, and not having all these outside things hanging over them. Um, you know, that, that can be tough. That what can about, be tough. So obviously, you know, talking about evaluating talent, you know, big piece is the coaching and the kid, you know, from a, from a parent perspective, what, what do you have for tips? You know, you're raising kids, you know, in your home and obviously your wife, you know, we talked about her earlier, you know, Zeb and I, you know, parents and what, what tips do you have for parents out there that, you know, are trying to raise athletes, you know, not just athletes, but, you know, high level character, young men and women. Yeah. I mean, I guess the first thing that I would say is, is there is no one size fits all. I mean, I have different kids and they probably, um, you know, they're not probably all the same and stuff like, you know, my own children, um, which buttons to push when to, um, but, um, you know, for me, and I, I think one thing is make sure like the kid it's as important, you know, to them, like if we're talking wrestling here as it is to you as a parent, mm -hmm. um, I tried to give my kid space and make sure that it was for him. If he wanted to do it, I was obviously glad. I mean, if I had to be completely transparent here, I love wrestling. And so, yeah, you know, who doesn't want their kid to wrestle a little bit, um, at least at some point to, you know, have a chance to gain all these attributes that we talk about, mm -hmm. that all three of us could sit here and talk the next hour about what we got through wrestling that's like carried on. Who wouldn't want their kid to experience that? We're not even talk talking how many medals they won or brackets they have hanging on their bedroom wall or anything. So yes, but you know, um, I was fortunate. I think I had a good example. I think I had a good example and that my parents supported me and would get, get me anywhere that I needed to go. That was within their means. They would never miss a day sitting in the bleachers. Um, they would save literally all their vacation days to watch me and my brothers wrestle, or, you know, it happened to be wrestling for us. If it would have been another sport or activity, I'm assuming it would have been the same. Um, and, you know, but at the same time, they, there was no, there was no, you know, unneeded pressure from them. The most pressure that I felt at all was just what I self-inflicted. And I think if you can do that, you know, it has to be the kid's passion. Mm -hmm. It sounds like a cliche or whatever, but I really do think, you know, um, you can drive them to every practice and tell them and send them to all the camps and tell them what they got to do, getting up, up in the morning, this and that. But if it's not what they're interested in, it's going to be hard. Um, my kid came to me in about eighth grade and he asked me why I never get him up in the morning and take him in to do like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, drilling or, or extra drilling or something like that, you know, how he put it. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, um, I, I want to get good. I, I want to get good. I'm going to be going into high school next year. And he might've been in seventh, but it was seventh or eighth grade. And he'd been wrestling and he had pretty good success, you know, growing up. He didn't win everything, but he was very competitive. And I said, well, you never asked. And he said, well, I got high school coming up. You know, I want to be a freshman state champion. And I'm kind of ad living here, but basically mm -hmm. I want to do right. I don't, I want to be good. I want to be, you know, why don't you ever like say, Hey, we're going in in the morning to do drills, to work on extra technique and all that. And I said, because you never asked Drew. And he said, well, I want to. And I said, well, okay, that's the first step. And, and he said, well, wh what do you mean? And I said, Hey, listen, I've tried to keep like your whole life, you know, make sure it was your thing. Not just because it's your dad's thing. Cause your dad coaches right. cause your dad college because your dad was a state champ because your dad's absolutely nuts about the sport of wrestling like your thing and, and he's, he said he's he's your oldest too so you're you're learning right you're learning yeah, too. Yeah. 
my oldest. Yeah, I'm learning. I hadn't, I hadn't had a trial run on this, you know, but I'd coach some guys whose dads maybe weren't like that. And I guess what I'll say about that is everybody wants the best for their kid. And sometimes you're learning as you go. Right. So we'd all like to have do overs and stuff like that. So when I would take him to practice, though, when he was young and going in Orange Crush, um, some of the times I would stay and I'd help mostly the other kids out. And then every once in a while, wa wander down by where he was. So he didn't feel like I was always over the top of him. But a lot of times I'd drop him off. Um, I'd go out in the truck. I'd make recruiting calls. I'd do whatever. I'd come up and then I'd come up for maybe the last 10, 15 minutes of practice. To me, it wasn't um, necessarily a good thing to be there watching the whole practice. Like, I, you know, I, I, I think kids need to learn to be coached and trained or learned or whatever under under people too i mean we send them to school we don't sit in their classroom the whole time and what you know we got to trust these people and then you know at the same time um you know help them when we can but be be dad a lot of the time and be coach a little bit of the time so anyway no. he said well tomorrow morning he said tomorrow morning we're going in tomorrow morning and i said okay yeah i don't have i don't have any of the beeves tomorrow morning we're, we're off tomorrow so that's fine and he said, okay, well, I'm going to go to bed. Uh, so just wake me up at 6.30. And uh, I remember this like it was yesterday. I said, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. What, what do you mean? What do you mean you're not going to do it? What do you mean? And I said, no, you wake me up. Nice. Dad, why can't you set your alarm? Why, why, nice. why, why I, I said, because if you set your alarm and come in and wake me up, I might be awake anyway. But then I know, man, you can't hit that snooze button. You can't say, ah, oh, not today. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll wait another day. We'll wait. You come get me. I know you're serious about going and doing it. And that's when we started. That's awesome. That's pretty cool. So my, I have a brother, Drew, I'm pretty close with. And uh, he brought up a point that made me think, you know, you have that approach where you're putting it in him wanting to do it, right? Yeah. He said he's no, you know, he's got boys and they're getting into sports. And he made a comment that I never thought of it this way. And I've seen it, but never. He's like, when you're watching these little kids in these sports, no matter what, it, what it is, if they do good or bad and they look over at the parent yep. first thing that that's a no, no, you know, they're not, they're not having the right environment at home. Right. They should be looking over a coach, not coach. dad in the stands. And it, yep. it's, it's just a natural action. If they're looking right at dad, it's just not a, a yep. not a good situation. Right. I mean, it's, it's right. the spot real quick, but obviously that that's a very observant of you to say, okay. You, yeah, you and I, and, right? and you're, you're exactly right on that. I mean, I've seen that a million times. I've seen that in college practices, man. Oh, man. I've seen it on college practices. You know, you have open room. We, uh, I mean, at Oregon state, we had, you know, uh, Saturday practices sometimes, you know, before football weekends, mm -hmm. right. Room up there. Mm -hmm people come up and then we have a cookout and, and I've seen college kids, man, like they're going, they're scrapping and it's high level wrestling, extremely high level wrestling and, you know, get a takedown or get taken down, whatever. And, you know, immediately look over at that and it's like, Hey, right here in between these lines, like right here, you know? So that's a hard thing, man. Um, so none of us, get it completely right all the time. But that was some of the things I tried to keep from happening to my kid, because I imagine like anything, you know, kid, like they probably already feel it. Even if they mm -hmm. don't admit, it, they probably already feel it. Hey, you know, my dad was a college coach. My dad was an all American. I need to be, and that's not it. Mm -hmm. that's, not, that's not it, you know? So interesting stuff, man. In interesting. Hey, yeah, Kevin, you know, you taught or you co I'm sorry, not taught you coached. Obviously with Jim, with J Rob, um, but, you know. Talking Troy Steiner, you know, Troy Steiner, they don't that guy's tougher than a boiled owl, as your brother in law would say. Oh, Troy Steiner leaves Oregon State. He goes to Fresno and, and, and he does the job, man. They get. An all American. I mean, man, you got you gotta understand. I you know, I went to Kent State, Jared and I went to Kent State. We didn't have all Americans, Cleveland State, we didn't have all Americans for 20 plus years. This guy does it in three years. He makes this program and he's 
two years, whatever it was. You know, because uh, he's got an NFL uh, running back, you know, on, on a team, and the guy's an All-American at 197 with Hockett. And, and it's a local guy, right? It's a local yeah. guy from five minutes away. Clovis High. Yeah, Clov- it's a Clovis guy, right? So yeah. what's wild about it to me is – they're they're viable. They are really good at Fresno State, and they dropped the program. And you and I have had we've gone so much back and forth. How guys in the West are at a they're at a disadvantage, but our all time greatest wrestler in the sport of wrestling and all in a United States of America and NCA at least is is a Westerner from Utah, right? Yep. With Coach Sanderson and um, the West has obviously just tremendous talent but it's spread out. What kind of uphill battle are they fighting out in the West, Kevin? And, 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 you know, you see what Troy did at Fresno quick. He did it quick. It didn't take a decade. It took under five years to have an all American. And that's how we, you know, unfortunately that's how we measure the sport is how many all Americans do you have? Not how many round of 12 or academic all Americans and graduates and APR and all that. We look at all Americans straight up, and now we got a guy in the NFL who does it for him, right? What kind of uphill battles are you guys fighting out west with college wrestling? Well, first of all, I'll say that um, I talked to Troy today, um, and you, you've talked to me enough to know. I mean, you talk about a guy. If you were going to start a program, if you were going to start a program, I, and maybe not even wrestling, like just anything. A guy that once he's he's in, he will jump in with both feet and give everything he's got. It is it became his life. You talk about a guy that was you know um, is the salt of the earth as a human being is probably a better human being than he is a wrestling coach and he's one of the best wrestling coaches I've ever been around. Probably one of the toughest human beings I've ever been around. Um, and you know, it's just, it's, it's awful. I mean, it's terrible. Um, you know, I think what we see in the West is kind of, you know, it started 40, 40 years, 45 years ago. And, you know, um, I think what you get is, you know, when you have strength in numbers, when you have conference affiliates or geographic um, schools geographically close to you that sponsor something, in this case, it's wrestling, but, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, um, you know, you have a better chance of, you know, building on what you have. And, and in this case, like staying around, you know, you look at what a, you know, unfortunate situation it is for the kids in the Rocky Mountain states and the Western Pacific coast and Northwest states to have, you know, four or five, maybe division one programs in, you know, eight or nine states out there. I mean, without writing them down, I'm just going, but you know, but it started, you know, with, with um, a lot of the at, at the time, Pac-10 schools, Pac-10 schools and, um, you know, Big Sky schools where, you know, we had programs at UCLA, at the University of Washington, at Washington State, you know, obviously the Ducks eliminated later. And in my opinion, they were kind of the, they, they started this last um, 10 year wave of, cause they went and then it was like pretty much one every year, but you know, the Montana's, the Montana States, the Weber States now, you know, Utah state, and we had UNLV and now, you know, now Boise, um, you know, New Mexico state had wrestling, uh, Northern Arizona had wrestling and, you know, all the division twos and division threes and all that. But I think if it becomes a, you know, I, I, I mean, I think it's, I think it becomes like, you know, if you're a bottom line guy and you're looking at just like the bottom line, well, what does it cost to travel? Well, let's see. Okay. Well, 
you know, 70% of our trips are a plane ride and they're going back here, you know, obviously dollars and cents matter in the athletic administrator uh, world. Um, and then the, it's also, a, it's, it's really, it's, it's also a really, um, unfortunately, a follower business, in my opinion. Um, you know, I, the longer I'm around this, was around it, and then even watching from the sidelines, you know, but pretty close to what's been going on the last three years. A lot of these people are followers. They're really not leaders like you would expect an athletic director to be. They're not. And then you get, you can't, you, you compound that by getting some of these guys where it's a stepping stone position. So they're not invested. You know, in the case of Fresno State, they're not invested as much as a guy like Troy Steiner. They come there, man, first chance they got to go to a Power Five conference as an AD or an associate AD or something. Man, they're on the first thing smoking out of town. They're not as committed to the long term and, and probably even some of the coaches, right, in the, in the revenue sports, probably even. Um, so, you know, they make these decisions that unfortunately, you know, I thought Fresno State coming back and having wrestling was one of the greatest wrestling stories of the last 20 years. And then not just to do it, but, but wrestle on the USS Midway, uh, host meets in the Save Mart Center with 7,000 people. I mean, you could probably count on one hand how many schools have had 7,000 or above in the last couple of years, Deb. I mean, if any of them are out of the, outside of the Big Ten, outside of Oklahoma State, I'm not aware of them. I would agree with that statement, obviously, because uh, I mean, you know, maybe even what they did, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's just wild. It, it's, and so this it's guy's absurd. a visionary. This guy's a visionary. He's a committed, I mean, nose to the grindstone. He, he has, he does all the right things. He has the kids doing stuff in the community. He has season tickets. He has all this stuff going. And, you know, for me, obviously, I'm a wrestling guy, so I don't think you'd expect anything um, different for me to say, but very short sighted, like bad decision. Um, but, you know, the broader picture is, you know, you lose Oregon. The next year you lose Portland State. Then you get, you know, then I'm doing scheduling. And Troy goes to Fresno and I'm doing scheduling for the first time. And man alive, you want to talk about a tough job calling these guys and trying them to get out there and spend 10 or 12 grand for a dual meet when you're on an Island out there. So scheduling becomes a harder and harder thing because, you know, people want to go wrestle like we do in division one wrestling, a couple duels on a road trip. And then, you know, and then they call and they, they say, Hey, so if we came out there, what we could probably get in the, we could probably what get out of town, get in vans or, or charter a bus and go like, what is it? Three or four hours over to Boise. No, man, it's nine. Ooh. Oh, what, what about to Stanford? Eh, same, you know, just the geographic, um, you know, challenges of that is much different than, Hey, if you're at, if you're at Edinburgh or you're at, uh, you're at Cleveland state or you're at Kent, man, you might get on a bus and go three hours in any direction and be able to hit a couple dual meets. Now with that, we have beautiful country. We have less, less people. We have more spread out. We have all the things that you love to do um, open space, but it can and is a challenge when, you know, talking about some of these other things. Kevin, what's crazy when you say that to me, I covered George Mason last year. George Mason dueled Edinburgh at noon, and then they duel. They drive over to Cleveland State, and they duel Cleveland State at 7 p.m. <laughs> so what's crazy about that is you guys – and I actually did do it once out there when Portland State had a program. And, Jim, you remember this. I covered your duel with Boise, and then I drove up to Portland State with – well, behind their bus, right? And I covered the Boise – Portland State duel, which was 47 nothing or whatever it was. But it's wild because you guys, you just can't do that anymore. And it's like Michigan comes out to Gale. Michigan can't do that. They just can't do that. And, yeah. And what's wild is if you're you're in Ann Arbor, you can be in Columbus in under three hours. How about that? Yeah. Right? And, and, and you and I have talked about this proximity is a crazy thing. And it's just wild, man. I, yeah. Troy it's Steiner, a, you know, like my heart goes out to that guy because he took a leap of faith. He moved his family from Corvallis, Oregon, down to the Fresno area. And 
He's just a great guy. And it, it bums me out because they were viable. They weren't viable. They were just, they were good. Yeah. I mean, he did a lot of good things, you know, he got the club going, he got the community support behind him. He had a, like, I think he had a, he had a world medalist. Did he not in the, in Alone. the, yeah. Ron, Alone. he had a world medalist. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, Fresno is one of those things. If I had to pick five or 10 places like on a map and say, that is a school that should have wrestling. Fresno is one of them, you know, like they should have wrestling. I mean, if you go into the community around there, um, the high school, the youth ranks, like all that, that's one of the schools that you say, no brainer, they should have wrestling. I think somebody in Montana should have wrestling. I've been to the Montana state tournament. How many times they are crazy, man. Uh, uh, a gang of thieves, if they wanted to make 2 million bucks, could easily do it the second week of February every year by going to the little towns in Montana. Dude, you go to Butte, Montana, there is no one there. They're all in Billings, in the Metra, in Billings. You could rob every house in the county. I mean, the people blow the top off this arena. They love wrestling. And then, you know, you look and, you know, the Grizz and the Bobcats, like, those guys are both of them should have wrestling. Agreed. University of Toledo should have wrestling. They should they have, have the wrestling. World Cup for however long, right? Like University of Toledo should have wrestling. Still the most all Americans in mid American conference history. Wow. Wrap your brain around that. Wow. Was, well, Central was might have taken them over in the last year or two. Was the uh, great three Woj or four years? What's that? Was the great Woj part of that? Come on. You know the Great Wolf is a part of that. Greg well, Wojciechowski was one of the all-time greats. Stuff in, in Toledo, but I wasn't positive if he was a Toledo U guy. Uh, the Woj went to Whitmer, bro. The Woj was from North Toledo, my friend. Won an NCAA title. Hey, how about this? The Woj lost one year to Jess, our guy Jess, our guy Jess, right? And then he won, and then he lost another year to Chris Taylor. Wow. How about that? How about that? The Woj was in between Jess, right? Jess Lewis, one of the all-time greats, an NFL guy, uh, fourth in the uh, Olympics. And then he was – and then he lost. It was a runner-up to uh, Chris Taylor in the NCAA Finals. So it's just, you know, I mean, Toledo is just – Yeah. And then, obviously, with their tradition with the, the World Cup and all that, but wrestling so much. Well, you know, initially, I Saturday, Saturday mornings and afternoons with my grandpa, you know, and it was like watching it with my grandpa. And, you know, people love to do stuff with their grandpa. Like, you know, maybe, well, I got hooked. He was hooked and I got hooked. And I don't know if it was just that it was grandpa that initially hooked me, but I stayed with it, man. And it kind of ebbed and flowed. It had its real popular times, you know, Hulkamania and all that. And it kind of, it, and it kind of goes, but man, I, <laughs> this is crazy, man, but I've had a heartbeat on it for, you know, there'll be times where I don't see it, but of course I can read up on the internet at least what's been going on. And I think it's the stories, Zeb. I think it's the stories. I mean, you see some really athletic and stuff um, things, but I like the promos. I like the stories, you know, like that uh, attach. They, they get the people kind of like, you know, a Hallmark movie does <laughs> with, with the wife <laughs> or like soap operas. Do. Great <laughs> analogy. Great analogy. You Great get attached analogy. to the characters. You want to see them win or you want to see them lose depending on like their character. And yes, it's called suspension of reality. I know what they're doing is like that they know what's going to happen. Like, you know, I know that it's like how many people watch, you know, uh, fast and furious or star Wars and know that some of the special effects probably aren't stuff we can do in our cars and stuff like that. Suspension of reality, man. 
and I just get so into the stories. My wife hates it. She hates the loud voice, shit talking, as they say. But, you know, a lot of time, it's kind of a reflection of what people ha have. Like, Mr. McMahon, to me, is the greatest heel character ever. And I think so many people could identify with the people in the crowd booing him because who doesn't at least hate their boss sometimes or spite him a little bit or want him to see him get his ass kicked. And that's why the stone cold and the rock thing versus Mr. McMahon worked for so long. He's the snob, the guy that, you know, has all the union guys down there doing stuff like, and, 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 is is the asshole that never has his hands dirty too and, uh, alongside him and i think just people can relate to it so, so uh, was H hogan your guy then was hogan your oh, guy? oh god no no oh, no man. no flair is my guy flair okay Fla flair is my guy um my all-time all-time favorite guy um and it's not close and then there's, depending on the day, there's five other guys, 10 other guys that I could put in my top five, but he's all time, my favorite. Nice. And so, so, well, so, so Kevin, so Kevin, I got to interrupt you here. WTBS, I don't even mind. Man, WTBS with my grandpa all through the eighties. So, okay. But I got to interrupt. I got to get in here. Jared and I wrestled with Nick Nemeth for him for, we both, I wrestled for five. He wrestled with him for four. For four, for five, for four, for five, right? We're we spent, yeah, we're roommates for right. And yeah. Jared lived with them. I roomed with them on the road. Four or five years for me. Four for Jared. Nick Nemeth, Dolph Ziggler. How? And we're layman's, dude. We're we don't know it. We don't follow it like you do. We don't follow WWE. We don't follow professional wrestling like you, like you do, Kevin. How good? is Nick Nemeth, Dolph Ziggler at his job. How good is he, Kevin? Top 1%. Wow. Top 1% in the business. Now, you, you're asking me a question. Like, I'm taking that as how good is he in the industry? How good can he work? What can he do? What can he... That doesn't translate to who has the belt and stuff like that. You don't know, you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, because, because the company guy decides that and they put it on a guy that they think is going to sell tickets or, you know, um, but how good of worker is he? How good, uh, like top 1%. You can put him with any, a myriad of guys and he can help carry the match. You can put him with a 50 year old guy that he can shine up and do 90% of the work, take the bumps, take all that. And, and, and make it a, a really good match, or he can work with a guy his size or a guy like Brock Lesnar or whatever it is and make a good match out of it. And that's how pros are, you know, and I'm not in the biz, but with talking with people like Risco and like, you know, can he have a good match with anybody? Yes. That's Why is crazy. he so good? Why is Nick Namath, Dolph Ziggler, why is he so good? And, why is he so respected among those guys? And why is he, why is he so good at like selling bumps, selling matches? You know, you guys talk marks, kayfabes, all this stuff. I, I don't talk that. You know, I don't speak that language, Kevin. Yeah. Why well, I is think Nick Nemeth Dolph really, Ziggler so good? He's really athletic. I, I, I think. Uh, he's have really you se have you seen him run? Have you seen him run? I have not seen him all run. I've only seen him all run right. the road. Uh, how's he run, though? No, I can't do it. I'm not. I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna blow up a spot right, like that. Right, I love on. those people no, so much. No, he's he's a he is athletic and he's a hard worker. I mean, he he knew from day one. I remember being a cat and he uh, got backstage at at the time the gunned or whatever uh, you know, and uh, he was meeting the big show and got all these pictures. And this is when you printed them out. And he said, "I'm gonna be. I'll I'll." I'll be on that stage someday. And here's, he's like, look how big his hand is compared to mine. And he's getting backstage pitching. And, you know, so he take you take that athleticism and then you take the hard work. Right. And he knew he was going to do it. Right. I mean, Zeb, you know him better than I, obviously, but he lives he, it. The thing he, about Nick is he lives it. And I think Dolph, Nick, whatever. I don't call him Dolph. 
He's Nick Nemeth. Right. He's Dolph Ziggler, whatever. He lives it, man. He that like we talk about living your gimmick. Nick Nemeth, Dolph Ziggler. That guy lives his gimmick. That is his deal. And I text with him every day. Every day, him, Mark Lundsman, and I, we get in this crazy knockdown drag out about Democrats, Republicans. It's the best, dude. Because basically, it's uh, Nemeth and I teaming up on Lensman. But it's like awesome because it's like, I just love these guys. You know, it's your, you, you know, Jared, you know, like Mike Tolar is your guy. Mm-hmm. Mike Tolar could call you right now and, you, and you'd be there, right? It's like, Nick Demas, my guy, right. uh, you know, whatever, whatever, Dolph Ziggler, Mark Lensman's my guy. They're, those are my Kenny Clark, uh, KC. Yeah. I mean, Kenny mm. Clark, Kinley Simmons, Simmons and I have butted heads, but they're still your guys. You mm-hmm. can't Joe C Joe Charlton. Those are your guys, man. Those yeah. are your guys. Kevin, you know that Kevin, you know, a guy you came in with, in your fourth or fifth year, just like Jared's my guy. Guys, you came in and you just lost a friend, uh, Kevin, with uh, one of the sonnens. But they're your guys, right? That bond oh, yeah. you create in college wrestling is just, it's unbreakable, right? Oh, yeah. 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 No, it's its special, you know? It's really special. It's, um, yeah, you just, and, I, and I'm sure, you know, you hear football players and stuff say it too, you know, like the guys, that, it, but wrestling, I mean, it's got to be right up there with anything, what you go through. It's different. Day. No, it's totally different. It's different. You suffer together. You suffer on top of the game time moments. You suffer in the sauna together. You suffer cutting the weight besides the sauna. You suffer in the drill sessions. You suffer in every part of it. And it's just, and, and we're almost snobs and we're elitist, but look at the combat sports. Yeah. You know, Kevin, the guy you coached at Oregon state is at the top of the UFC um, with Colby Covington. And we're almost snobs. We're almost like, no, our sports superior to yours. But if you look at the output, five of the seven UFC champs are the wrestling guys. Yeah. Yeah. We got something there, don't we, Kevin? We got something. Would you th- would you say that? I would say so. I mean, I think you know, and we've all known it for a long time and stuff. But um, you know, I guess that's that that that's the challenge is getting just getting more people to um, you know our biggest challenge is a sport being relevant when in the in the media in the having careers for our people having college programs around you know longer. Uh, more of them all that is somehow making other people realize that you know um and 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 i don't know man i don't know what you think about this stuff going on i mean like what 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 you think about you know some of these hopefully they work out you know hopefully some of these rtc cups or whatever had they're having these wrestling undergrounds and stuff like that hopefully work but i still think for the masses it's not the model. We, we, we need college wrestling. The teams are at right Good now at the Barbarian Center. The teams are, are working out tonight. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, tonight they're at the Barbarian Center working out. They're at they're, literally the Barbarian Center, Barbarian Hour. Since, Cincinnati, Ohio. They are working out at the facility that runs this show. Okay. Okay. So the RTC Cup, you know, next two days. And yeah, these are. Yeah. Uh, Reese is uh, Reese is doing a camp tonight. He just did a camp tonight there too. Okay. But, uh, well, he, he, he's got two locker rooms there. Josh has two locker rooms, sauna, weight room. I mean, he's got a the whole nine he, yards. Yeah. The Barbarian Center is a it's a really good spot, and the wildlife wants in there real bad too. <laughs> really? Yeah, he had a deer trying to get in the room. Oh, a little yeah. like a like a button buck trying to get in the room with his antlers. So it's on reflection, right? I mean, thought, thought it was. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, no, but that's, but come I'm on, Jared, sell he, it. Let's he sell didn't, it a little bit. Come on. K Rob didn't see it. So I'm trying to explain. Uh, what it's but that, you did see those deer out by the dungeon. I saw some deer out by the dungeon. I'll tell you what, you got elk out by the dungeon. Oh, wow. Really? Oh. The elk dude. The thing about the dungeon is, He's not far from British Columbia. Kevin, how far are you from British Columbia? An hour? Yeah, probably 
yeah, 70 miles, maybe? Wow. If the, yeah, hour. So maybe? North Idaho, that whole region that they're in, in the Pacific Northwest, not far. So, Jared, no, do you have gonna, anything I, else for my friend here? You're going to have to make a trip, a trek out to the dungeon. You already know I'm coming to the dungeon. You're talking to Jared, right? Well, the both of you. I mean, you know. Yeah, I've never I've been, been out there. That's on the been out that way. That that you, you love, might when explode. When love to. It's a different deal, right. Broski. Yeah. You I, got to put it on the to-do list. Right. I mean, you you really do. And what you do is you just come out, you know, you say, "Hey, I'm going to go out for a week." And I'm going to spend maybe like two days or parts of two days watching some wrestling. The rest of the time you do other stuff. So, so that's the, that's the, the plan then, huh? So two days of wrestling and what do I got to, what do I have to see? What, what's the, uh, like I said, I've always, I'm bad. These geography. aren't questions for Kevin's they're questions for me, by the way. Okay. All right. All right. Hey, <laughs> Kevin, would you agree with that? That you know more about where I live than I do. Would you agree with that? Am I being wrong? That, that you know more about where I live than you do, than I do? Okay, the That's Pacific the Northwest. Who should take Jared on a tour of the Pacific Northwest, me or you? Well, you're the, you're the fucking geography savant and stuff. <laughs> I mean, now I I'm, just live here, man. I'm, I'm <laughs> a complete opposite of geography. Dude, it's incredible. Thing. I've seen it. will explode. Uh, Listen, he tells me, I'll take he tells you. Me every time. He tells me every time. Do you realize where you live? I mean, what's around you? Want Kevin? I come from the Rust Belt. This, <laughs> this, like you, where you live, He's like this, four <laughs> trees and a bigger hill just in the house that you live on than whole Northeast Ohio. Because it's a fact. No, I'm not. No, that's a because that's a fact. It's not me making stuff up because it's a fact. That's why. He's that's why I say that because it's not BS. Because it's a fact. He has more elevation gain in the hill that he lives on, which is over 1,500 feet, than the whole state of Ohio. Wow. I, that's The just, hill he lives on. Jeez. It's a mountain, by the way. Dad, you know I got a jet ski. You know I got friends with boats. Like, do it up, man. Get out here. I am not scared, and you already know that. I know. Yeah, I need to make it happen. Yeah. All right. Are we good? I'm good if you guys are good. I'm good, man. I had the time of my life. Thanks, man. This has been fun. A lot of fun. Very, very great. Uh, grateful to meet you. I'm glad we I'm, crossed I'm really, I'm really happy for you guys. I'm glad you're doing this. I mean, I'm like, I, like I said, we, we had a common. Zeb, great minds must think alike. But I've been telling him for at least three years since I knew what podcasts were that he needed to do it. Likewise, he's been telling me that I needed to get my own gym and start having camp. So, you know what? That's what friends I'm, do, right? Tell them what, you know. To be fair. Yeah, he's uh Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Me. Well, thanks, yeah. guy. This has been fun. This has been a lot of fun. All right. Have a good one. Good talking, K-Rob. Okay, guys. Thanks, man. Yeah.